was a major event in the, in the development of this religion. Had he not given his first sermon, had he not made this a public event, then of course Buddhism would not have become a world religion. But he made this decision, he put it into words, and it is his remembered words which formed the core of the first scripture for the Buddhist. According to tradition, the Buddha then delivered the Deer Park Sermon at a place near modern Sarnath in India. Gautama Buddha began his sermon by discussing the noble truth of pain, which is a deep, pervasive awareness that human existence is temporary and full of ills. Perhaps the most famous part of the Buddhist doctrine are the so-called Four Noble Truths. And the first truth is said to be usually suffering. A lot of people um, wonder what this means because it seems, therefore, that Buddhism would be a very pessimistic religion. Some people suggested that perhaps we should call this that life is unsatisfactory. That is, um, I can, whatever it is that I do, ultimately it becomes unsatisfactory. So I can say if I'm tired and I sit down, then I can say sitting is wonderful. It's not suffering. But if I sit on an airplane from London to Chicago, I'm going to say sitting is, is not satisfactory. So the Buddhists say whatever we do always turns out to be unsatisfactory. And our suffering comes because we find that life is unsatisfactory and we long for it to be otherwise. So the Buddhists say that what we have to deal with is the fact that this is so. And how do we get out of it? How, do we, how can we determine uh, that it's, if it's like this, what's the escape? For the Buddhist, it's the idea that we have to have insight. We have to know what is really the case. And so the Buddhists say that the experiences which we have, we have to understand those experiences are in our mind. And that that's where we live our lives. So if I look at my finger, I can say my finger hurts. And the Buddha said, no, the finger is not hurting. The pain is something which is recorded and experienced only in the mind. I could cut off my finger, and that finger would never again feel pain. Here we must realize that all aspects of life are impermanent. We must see that what we call the self is essentially unreal, and that the nature of life as we ordinarily live it is restless and dissatisfying. Buddha's uh, first realization was life is suffering. And actually, when I even heard it myself, it, it sounds so negative. But the fact that uh, it's just a fact, it's not a negation of life, but it's for us to realize what life is all about. Because when we come out of the womb, uh, we start crying. It's, it's the pain of being born and that is the we could say the dharma of being born the law of being born so it's not like it's a negative view but it's a very close observation of what uh, how we're coming into life and how to prepare for this very life so therefore we can be free from the suffering we know how to be with it the four remaining elements of the noble eightfold path may be lumped together in the category of meditation. Though meditation is the final release from the cycle of life and death, Buddhist morality is not left behind when one meditates. During the emergence of Buddhism, the most important of the Indian caste groups was the Brahman. The Buddha proclaimed a way of salvation that had two quarrels with the Brahmanical religion. First, Buddhist salvation does not require the elaborate rituals that were a part of Brahmanism. Rituals deal only with outward, physical matters, not the inwardness of the human spirit. Buddhists believe that rituals cannot deal with the real causes of human suffering, nor can they lead to salvation. Buddhists had a second quarrel about the sacrifices that the Brahmins offered to the gods. These sacrifices call for the violent taking of animal life, and Buddhism teaches that human beings may slip into animal existences as a result of their evil deeds. 
And this greed, anger, and ignorance is the key. And that actually uh, pervades all human beings until it's being worked on. The small mind contains, the conditioned mind contains the greed, anger, and ignorance. And this is what has to be seen through. And when this is seen through, then you realize your harmony with your fellow man and also objects inanimate and animate objects, that you and them are the same. So you wouldn't want to kill anybody because you'd be killing yourself as well. Um, this is the study and practice of meditation that you begin realizing this very important aspect. Because we're very good at the other stuff. In fact, the whole society and culture is like a conspiracy against the spirit. And my feeling is that as we're approaching 2000, just the number 2,000 people know that something is missing. The five precepts of Buddhism can be understood as a parallel to the Ten Commandments. They might be translated as follows. Don't take any human or animal life. Don't take what is not one's own. Refrain from slander and untruth. Don't engage in illicit sexual conduct. Abstain from intoxicating or mind-muddling drugs. Buddhist doctrine constantly emphasizes that one's fate is the result of one's past deeds. If one suffers from physical ugliness, deformity, disease, or any ill fortune, it is due to one's own past action. Everything, karma is basically action. And it's, it's about cause and effect. Everything has a cause and everything has an effect. And so in meditation practice, we try to free ourselves uh, from this cause and effect to make a loophole in it by seeing through it. So people talk about if you, if you, uh, Buddhism or the Buddha Dharma is different than becoming a good person. Because when you become a, when you want to become a good person, when you want to do good, you become uh, a purpose. You have a purpose of being good, of what you think is good. So we even have to transcend that. So uh, studying Zen is not becoming a good person, but becoming a human being. And when you become a human being, then you are naturally, uh, you realize your basic goodness. Even ourselves are basic goodness, and then you realize the basic goodness of others. That's goodness. So it's not becoming doing good things for people, but it's, it's becoming self, selflessness and serving people is one of the greatest rewards. Yet existence as a human being is a great privilege because only a human can produce karmic merit. A person should eagerly seize his or her priceless opportunities for producing good karma but again, only a human can ascend to nirvana. At least in popular Buddhist thinking, much more than love or hate is carried on from life to life. Personal characteristics and subconscious memories also are transmitted. Genius may suddenly crop up in a family that seems ordinary. A loving married couple may meet again in a new life. A child closely resembling a deceased ancestor must be that ancestor, now reborn in this new form, and so on and on.